Give yourselves a hand. <laughs> Remain standing. Oh, stand up, stand up, stand up. We're going to do the gospel reading. It's a wonderful preparation for a gospel reading this morning that falls in the midst of another story. I think you'll recognize it from the eighth chapter of Luke, verses 43 through 48. Now, there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. And though she had spent all she had on physicians, no one could cure her. She came up behind Jesus and touched the fringe of his clothes, and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. And Jesus asked, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and press in on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me, for I noticed that power had gone out from me. When the woman saw that she could not remain hidden, she came trembling. And falling down before him, she declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let's pray together this morning. Gracious and loving God, as we have uh, been gifted with the dawn of a new day, we've also been gifted with the power of your gospel. It is good news for those of us in this room. It is good news for those outside of this room in the Denver metropolitan area. And it is good news for our nation and for our world. Help us not to forget that we are witnesses to that good news and that you have called us to be your voice, your heart, and your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Jesus was on his way to somewhere, somewhere else. He was on his way to someone else's home who was really more important than this nameless woman who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years. How impure she was considered by her community to have this kind of a disability, this kind of dis-ease. It did not allow anyone to touch her or they too would have been made impure. This is someone's daughter, someone's granddaughter, perhaps someone's aunt, someone's best friend, someone's neighbor, maybe even someone's teacher, or maybe someone's church member. You know, some, sometime the phone may ring, your cell phone, or maybe it will come by uh, Twitter, or maybe by text, and it will be your district superintendent, or your Episcopal leader, or your staff parish chair, or the chair of ad board, or the president of the United Methodist Woman. And they're gonna say to you, Pastor, I, I need you to come now. I have a family member who's in the last stages of their life and they've asked for you. If it's the bishop, the bishop may say, I'm not sure why, but they have asked for you. and I want to be faithful to their request, so I need you to come now. And with fear and trembling and gathering up your Bible and perhaps a, a, a kit that has some anointing oil in it and maybe your traveling communion kit and everything you can possibly think of that you will need to, to minister to someone's family member who is so very important and as you're, as you're ready to leave your office, you know who comes in. For me, at one of the small churches I served, his name was Bill, and he was a World War II veteran. And he came three days out of every five. There were days, I can confess this now because it's been 15 years ago, days I would duck down in my office so he couldn't see me. <laughs> he wanted to tell me what World War II was like for him over and over and over again. He wanted to tell me everything wrong with every other pastor who had served at his church before me. And I knew he was collecting information about me for the next pastor as well. <laughs> Some days he would bring me pictures. You know that's who's, gonna, that's who's gonna come to the office just as you're headed out to do the important work for the important person who needs your healing touch. That's what happened on the road when Jesus is ready to go and help the synagogue leader's daughter, 12-year-old daughter, just to make things more interesting, it's a child. How much more important is the child of the synagogue leader 
than a nameless woman who's been hemorrhaging for 12 years. I mean, if she's been hemorrhaging for 12 years, she can certainly handle hemorrhaging for a day or two more <laughs> till Jesus gets back to her. What's going to change, really? But she touches him, and he is touched by her. She reaches out and touches him, and he is touched by her. How long has it been since you've been touched by someone's need? Since your heart broke because of someone's pain? You know, I stood up here yesterday and was glibly telling us all that we need to be prophetic and missional and we're going we're gonna to bring the word to our congregations. I believe all of that. We're going to bring out the word to our congregations about racial issues that have flared up again in Ferguson, Missouri. And we're going to bring a word about the conflict in Gaza and we're going to bring a word about the Ebola virus in Western Africa, and we're going to bring a word about, about the drone strikes and the targeted airstrikes in Iraq, and we're going to bring a word about the violence in Ukraine and Russia. And we're, we're going to bring all these words, and in the midst of bringing all those words, we need to have our baskets filled, and as we fill our baskets, then there are others whose baskets are empty as well. And so in the midst of trying to gather all the information we need to bring the good word to our congregations about all of these different issues that we have to educate ourselves about and be aware of and, and, and have an understanding of so that we can be faithful when we bring a word about it, there are people who don't stop needing, who don't stop needing us because we are the representation of the presence of Christ. So as we're doing our work, understanding what it takes to create an environment for clergy excellence, most especially to create an environment to invite and, and enable and empower clergy candidates. We must not forget that we are representations of the presence of Christ and people need and want and desire to be in the presence of the living Christ. And, and we have to embrace the fact that, that that's us with humble confidence we have to embrace the fact that that is us and sometimes that means that we have to be willing to be broken enough to be tender to the World War II veteran as well as to the Episcopal leaders mom or aunt or sister we have to allow our our hearts to break even if we don't know Michael Brown and his parents or the or the police officer who shot him whose name we don't know yet. We have to be willing to allow our hearts to break over these things that are so difficult. And, and for some of us, that may not be too difficult because we may say that we're already broken. You've seen the outpouring of emotion that has come from people since Robin Williams committed suicide. That has touched a nerve in this society that reminds us that before people are going to be willing to listen to us about Ukraine and Russia, about the Gaza Strip, about the Ebola virus in West Africa, about even race relationships in this country, before people are going to be willing to listen to us, they have to know that we understand brokenness and we understand their pain and that somehow we have to find a way to reach in and connect and part of what that means is that as we create an environment for folks who feel called to the ministry, we have to be brave enough to be vulnerable. That we don't have it all together. That while we may have been a ministry a long, long time, there are still weak places inside of us. I, I decided for my 50th birthday, I'm now 52 by the way, I decided for my 50th birthday that I should get some help that I should get some psychological help because I'm sure there were problems. I'm sure I had problems. And I needed somebody to help me find them and dig them up and fix them. And I was clear they needed to do that in three sessions. I had set goals that by the time I was 50, 
that I wanted to, because I started at Grace when I was 40, I wanted to, I wanted to know that I was going to leave Grace better than what I found it. And, and, and I felt like at 50 I had pretty much succeeded in that. Don't ask the congregation, but I felt that way. And, and, I, and I had set a goal that I wanted to run a half marathon, and I did that and survived. And I had set a goal that I wanted to finish a doctor of ministry degree, and I did that. And then I realized I hadn't set any goals after the age of 50. So I wanted this person to not only fix me, but tell me what my direction was from 50 through, let's say, 75, 80, something, somewhere around in there. In three sessions. So I shared that with her when I first sat down. Don't delve into my, my home life from when I grew up. My, my, my relationship with my dad is really fine. He asks me how my car is, I say good, and then I talk to my mom. It's all excellent. <laughs> I knew going in, I knew more than she did. I really did. You know, I've done this a long time. And she said, okay, what do you think about the Pope retiring? I'm paying good money for this. What? <laughs> she said, no, really, you're a Methodist pastor. What do Methodist pastors think about the Pope retiring? And I said, well, that hasn't happened in like 600 years. She goes, I know, go figure, <laughs> right? She goes, well, what, what do you think happened? Do you think it's political? Do you think it's really personal? What do you think? And I, so I start believe it or not, expounding on my opinion about the Catholic Church, the state of the Catholic Church today, why the Pope retired, and in the midst of that, she said, Nanette, when was the last time your heart was broken? Gosh, she's smart. <laughs> she said, I have all these facts about you. I can tell you're passionate. What makes you cry? Oh my gosh, is this Barbara Walters? What is your deal? <laughs> she says, I think you carry the pain of a lot of people. And maybe this Jesus you follow wants somebody to help you carry yours. It's been two years, I'm still going to see her. <laughs> She says, you tell all those Methodists you meet in Colorado that they need help. <laughs> the hemorrhaging woman needed someone to share her burden, and Jesus needed to be touched. I, want to, I have a video clip I want you to watch. It, it goes for seven minutes, so let me just warn you, but it's so great. It's so, so great. It's a poem by Shane Coizan. Some of you may have seen it. It's called To This Day. If we could run that clip. We are called to minister in that world, as Henry Nouwen would say, wounded healers to acknowledge our vulnerability and our weakness is brave. Read Brene Brown, Daring Greatly. Read Glennon Melton Doyle, Carry On Warrior. To admit our vulnerability is to be, even as Jesus was, willing to be touched by others. And when others realize that we are touched by their vulnerability, they will hear our prophetic word in a new way and may indeed change the world. Amen. Friends, we're going to do the prayer for peace. I'm running over. We're going to do the prayer for peace and then we're going to end the service this morning. So if we could uh, pull up the prayer for peace. Remember, Prince of Peace, the peoples of the world divided into many nations and tongues. Deliver us from every evil that obstructs your saving purpose and fulfill your promises of old to establish your reign of pre peace from the curse of war and all that creates it. Lord, from believing and speaking lies against other nations. Lord, from narrow loyalties and selfish isolation. Lord, from fear and distrust of other nations, from all false pride, vainglory, and self-conceit. From the lust of the mighty for riches that drives peaceful people to slaughter from putting our trust in the weapons of war and from want of faith in the power of justice and goodwill. 
from every thought, word, and deed that divides the human family and separates us from the perfect realization of your love. Almighty God, do indeed deliver us from that sense that we have to carry the world, your world, on our shoulders, that we have to create in our congregations a kind of vitality that sometimes leaves you out of the center. Help, help us to know that your vitality lives in us already, that we move out not from a place of abundance, but as Bishop Hagea said, from a place of enough, and that as we are enough, you will create in us the courage and the bravery we need to be vulnerable for your people, to be touched, and to be able to touch those who are in greatest need. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. God be with you for a wonderful day.